All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Mitzi Serrato, and I am back for another installment uh, in my recent book release, uh, The Best New True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime. And I am joined by, uh, this is the second time I'm joined by him, so this is really thrilling. We're we uh, Partners in Crime. <laughs> yeah, we're Partners in Crime. Paul Willits from the UK. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Oh, very well, thanks. thanks. Yeah, you were telling me in the green room about your uh, you were in uh, serial killer mode earlier with this creepy well, I, I, That probably needs some explaining. I was stripping <laughs> paint and heavily masked up. So I was saying to Mitzi, it looked a bit like um, uh, I was sort of dissolving some body in acid. I had so much protective gear on. So well, if, yeah, if, if if your story was sort of themed with that, like the acid bath mm. killer, we would be all, you know, all yes. set with the <laughs> yes. in, in, in the correct mode. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, well, I'm really glad um, we have you back. Um, actually, uh, just to mention if uh, anybody wanted to know enough, you better want to know. Uh, Paul was actually in uh, the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues and criminals. So it's great to have you back. It's always nice when I get people who want to come back and do another story for another book. So. It, was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. It's a nice opportunity. Thanks. Well, you blew the bank as well for this book because your story is the longest one in there. <laughs> oh, right. I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, I know the books are getting like fatter and fatter. And my publisher is saying, yeah, they can't get any fatter. The printing costs are too high. <laughs> yeah, we have a tendency to... To, to overrun over word counts and things anyway well so. you know i mean if there's, if there's some things just require a lot of um yeah, you know so. detail yeah. i mean i just um finished a story for book seven and it, it was a real struggle to to try to keep yeah. it in some mm. i mean i think i could literally spin it into a book but um the, the criminal is so heinous i don't <laughs> think i could get a publisher for it <laughs> Yes. And there is there is when it comes down to it, something depressing about spending your your sort of life in the company of some monster for two years or whatever. Is I know. I know. I know. And then I would really in order to actually yeah. if I did want to do the book, I'd need to go yeah. and interview the guy. And he's just so oh, horrible. Really? I don't know if I want to go <laughs> yeah. to sit across from him at the prison and like chat. <laughs> but you might find yourself in. Uh, was it the was it front page story that re recent film that uh, what two three years ago about the New York Times writer befriends the murderer and uh, with with terrible consequences? Oh 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 oh! I, hey, it could happen, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I just want a quiet life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I find find myself drawn to a lot of archival based books that I've written in the past because it simplifies things. You can't get sued by the dead for a start. Yeah, we've had that discussion as well, that if everybody's been dead for at mm. least one or two, you know, a couple hundred years, it's unlikely someone's going to come mm. back and say, yeah. hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've, you've, you've said something and yeah. I don't like it. It is quite disconcerting. The nearest I've ventured into sort of recent history was into the sort of 80s, early 90s. and. Um, that felt quite, I felt quite vulnerable in a way. And it made your relationship with the material quite different because you, there was a fair worry about causing upset to people apart, never mind life. Yeah. yeah, that's something I'm always thinking of as well because I tend to do more contemporary pieces and someone's mm. still living. And I don't want mm. to be thinking that if they're reading it, I don't want to be digging mm -hmm. the knife in even more, so yes. to speak. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Paul's written a really uh, interesting story um, called Whirlwind Romance. Uh, when it does sound so nice, you can sort of see like, you know, the couple running across the green field, the sheep in the distance and embracing. Um, <laughs> Paul, it's not quite like that, is it? <laughs> not really. There's a certain amount of irony in that title. <laughs> um, in fact, I was thinking about it only today because it's a story that... Um, is is at the center of a very famous literary essay. It's, it's at the center, of, this essay crops up in the piece I've written. There's a section about the sort of aftermath of this crime, because it was, the crime was uh, has been dubbed since it happened by an academic, rather wittily and or stylishly, the, the blackout Bonnie and Clyde story, because it's about the, this couple that go 
on the run and carrying out all sorts of pretty senseless crimes in wartime London in the tail end of the war. Anyway, th this particular crime um, is the centerpiece for a very famous George Orwell essay called The Decline of the English Murder. And uh, I reread it today. And actually, I've got it up on, on the other half of my screen. I might dip into it. I mean, it's a beautiful essay, you know, very stylishly written, everything you'd expect from Orwell. However, you know, Orwell was so prescient and so perceptive about all sorts of things. Yeah. He wasn't about this at all. Because he talks about, in the introduction to, to the, the piece, he talks about, I mean, it's an oft-quoted oft piece. I mean, I'll scroll up to it because it's just so such a nice bit of writing. Yeah, he says, says, it's a Sunday afternoon, preferably before the war. The wife's already asleep in an armchair and the children have been sent out for a nice long walk. You put your feet up on the sofa, settle your spectacles on your nose and open the news of the world. And what he imagines this typical reader reading is about murder, just fascinated by the sort of true crime stories. And he cites the golden age of true crime as, as occurring between 1850 and 1925. And he mentions a string of cases like uh, the Dr. Crippen case, the case of Dr. Neil Cream, who um, Dean... Um, Dean Job wrote so brilliantly about quite recently in an American published book. And um, and in fact, it's someone else, I'm, another writer of all, who knew all well, a guy who I, I wrote a biography of years ago, a, a, a London bohemian by the name of Julian McLaren Ross, who was a brilliant novelist and was also a very good critic. He once referred to those criminals like Neil Cream. Dr. Cripp and I forget the other one, I think it was Brides in the Bath Smith, as the as the equi the criminological equivalent of he, he said this rather jokely of, of Thomas Hardy, Joseph Conrad, <laughs> and uh, Henry James. And Orwell uh, Orwell clearly thinks the same in a way. And he 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 poo-poos, he sort of said, Well, cri modern crimes, and he's writing in 1944 or possibly 45 saying modern crimes just have nothing on this because they just lack these ingredients that about that were based in a very stable society in sort of Victorian and Edwardian England and he quotes the number of novels that were written about these criminals and like the the, the Thompson Bywaters case which was a, a sort of another criminal couple case or nominally a criminal couple case uh, that spawned uh, at least one novel. Anyhow, uh, Orwell eventually builds up in this essay to sort of poo-poo the case in, that I've written about in Whirlwind Romance. And I'll just get up another quote just to just to show you actually how wrong he was about this case. But he, he, he says, perhaps it's significant that the most talked of English murder of recent years should have been committed by an American, an English girl, who'd become partly Americanized. You can, you can just feel the disdain in that, <laughs> in, in his, his literary voice when he says that. But it's difficult to believe that this case will be so long remembered as the old domestic poisoning dramas, product of a stable society where the all-prevailing hypocrisy did at least ensure that crimes as serious as murder should have strong emotions behind them. And that's what he so disliked about the about the what was at the time branded the cleft chin murder, which was this this couple on the the run and um, carrying out these crimes right in London and its environs in 1944. Um, and actually, it probably he kind of misses the point because the very right the thing he dislikes and he sees as valueless in this particular story is the very thing that possibly makes it. To relevant to our kind of era it's the fact it's so random and it's mm -hmm. so lacking in motivation it's so rooted in in um this couple's fantasies about movies they're both they both kind of imagine themselves as as criminals in movies with the kind of glamour spurious glamour that goes with it the the the, the girl in this couple um the self-styled Georgina Jones, or Georgina's the affectation Jones she got from a short-lived marriage, 
and Carl Holton, the other the, the, the other half. Um, they're both. They, well, they talk about themselves as if they're movie characters, and this is yeah. cited in all the criminal papers. And uh, so it's very interesting that it's this sort of Hollywood inflected uh, crime. Well, I know. I mean, and, and Orwell also stating about the um, the stable society. Now, I think one of the most relevant things in this story, and I and I, and I know this is your thing, is to really this, that sense of place and to bring the reader into that sense of place. Mm -hmm. um, this this time frame, this story took place during the Second World mm -hmm. War, and we can say this was certainly not a stable time. Um, and I, it mm -hmm. sounds to me that that contributed to, you know was a big contributing factor as well um do you want to yeah. address that a bit yeah i mean i think think it's one of the things that occurred to me actually in just rereading the piece the other day which was a long while since i actually wrote it and it's it's odd how <laughs> it was disconcerting how quickly you can forget these things I know. The details um I, mean, I found myself in you know promoting books where people in the audience in a sense seem to have a firmer grasp on the material <laughs> than I do because it's I, know, I never written remember kind of, who's in what book yes, you know, I'm, talking, I'm talking to people I'm like are you in that one <laughs> yes yeah yeah um but um yeah the uh, where were we um Sorry, the, whole, me the time, the, the time frame, and the completely um, chaotic nature of yeah. these. Yeah, it 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 was the thing that occurred to me today was was that these two people could easily have just disappeared, lived perfectly ordinary, peaceable lives, and not be remembered by anyone but some family researcher looking at their family tree, or, or just being a distant memory of some elderly person now. Uh, and they and it was just this chance meeting that brought these two kind of chemical ingredients that produce a detonation. They were just exactly the wrong people to be placed together by chance, and um, and also in it, and it was the circumstances they wouldn't have been brought together had it not been for the war, and it was the war that created this chaotic um, context for them. And uh, and I've, I've, as, as I say, I've written a lot of historical based sort of what publishers call narrative nonfiction books. Some true crime, some on the kind of edge of true crime, and a number set in London of this sort of period. And one of the things that really strikes me about this period that people don't, just don't talk about enough, I think, or don't talk about it at all, is that, because there's always a slightly self, from a generation before me, that self-satisfied thing about the 60s. I mean, this was the sexual revolution. It was the moment that transformed British society. And, and at, the society, I suppose, in the Anglosphere. And actually, it was the 40s. The 40s were the true sexual revolution. And it was the true moment when it shook people. I mean, this is more commonplace that it, it, it questioned sort of gender roles and things and got women out of the home. You know, endless things have been written about that, but not about this sense that it was a sexually transformative period. It was a period when you could have kind of all sorts of casual encounters and they were going on all over the place. And there was a kind of degree of sexual license that was really alien to, to the decades before and in, in some ways to the decade afterwards. And it's well, a really also, fascinating period. Was, yeah. and, well, I was uh, going to say that when, you, when you're thinking death is going to happen at any moment, I think there's any, any restraint goes out the window as well. Yes, it's that sort of seize the day ethic, I suppose, that people often talk about when they're the, in oral histories and things of the period. Um, and, yeah, and it would just bring unlikely people together as well, especially in London, because it was so fantastic. You know, it was the world's leading city at that point uh, in all sorts of ways. And it was, was among the world's most cosmopolitan cities because you had the... Art people from armies all over the world there. Um, and one of the, as you were saying in your original question, one of the things that really um, attracts me to historical writing, whether or not uh, um, historical nonfiction, is, is that I mean, I've come from a slightly odd background for a nonfiction writer in that uh, it's heavily kind of fine art. My background's heavily fine art. That, both my parents were painters and I 
uh, there are other connections, sort of visual arts connections. And uh, I suppose through that, that I'm always interested in the visuals within these things. And I'm very keen to, in the way that if a portrait painter would traditionally uh, try and set the, the sitter in uh, will surround them with things that reflect the personality and you know often making some kind of witty comment or sometimes making some kind of witty comment and I, so I'm very keen to say in writing a biography or anything else not to sort of abstract the person at the center of it from that world which is I think it's all too often done so I'm very keen to get a sense of the world they're moving through and what it looks and feels and smells like and when you start doing that kind of minute level investigation which can obviously just take over and become a bit too much yeah. but so if you're wanting to recreate if you found some archival account of people moving across london on a specific day uh, at a specific moment uh, you you know there are ways the Met London Met Office or sorry not the London Met the Met Office the British Weather Archive has incredibly detailed material about specific moments in specific places so you can you can gather all sorts of material and there are archives for instance where you can get um, the accounts really of what buildings were like the interior and exterior of buildings at particular periods especially in london and uh, those things can throw up um revelation little tiny revelations that can change your preconceptions of the period for instance i was i was writing about a um a an espionage story for a book called rendezvous at the russian tea rooms which was about a it was an american connected story about this american code clerk in the embassy in london called tyler kent who was a sort of womanizer and he was also um, a Soviet agent, and he transferred from the, the American embassy in Moscow to London. And the London code room acted as a conduit for all the codes from and ciphers from every American embassy across Europe. And he was stealing absolutely everything from this embassy. I mean, that was anyway. That that's part of the background to this story. And, he, he he's involved romantically with this not um, and um, she's a fashion right white russian fashion designer who um was a nazi spy and he gets entangled with her and uh i was trying to reconstruct a, an odd little quite well documented scene in which this fashion designer anna volkov goes with a group of these other like-minded women to go to a newsreel cinema on Oxford Street, and these these were these ran full time. They were just simply showing the news on uh, regular programs, and they go there to specifically to boo Churchill, who's on an, on the latest newsreel. And this is in 1940. And anyways, I'm I've got this journey recounted about how they get there, and I was just looking at the buildings, getting information about the, the cinema they go into. And then I discovered this extraordinary thing that next door to it, or, or two doors along, was a vegetarian restaurant. You think, that doesn't really go with my image of 1940 London. Quite a big, yeah. well-established vegetarian restaurant. <laughs> and it's so you get these little delights that just throw you. And... Uh, that's something that's great to be sort of slightly unsettled as a writer. Well, and in, in, in your story, um, World in Romance, we're always at the milk bar, and I was having flashbacks to the film A Clockwork Orange, and it was always that milk bar. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> that was, yes. was triggering that in my head. I'm I seeing like Alex that, yeah. and his eyelashes. <laughs> yes, it's a very yeah, it's a very particular thing that just about carried on into the 60s, I think, of the milk bars. But yeah, they were a big thing. And, uh, yeah. And it was a, yes, well, it was a I, train they meet in, the black and white milk bar. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, the chrome, the way you describe it. I mean, that's what I'm saying. When you read the story, it's like you're right there. Um, for for some listeners who who aren't that um, up on World War II, to, uh, just explain a little bit because we're our our couple, our partners in crime here are the Blackout, Bonnie and Clyde. That's what they've been dubbed. Um, yeah. The Blackout. Just to t tell us what it was like during the Blackout and how this, you know, I mean because obviously this was a great um, great situation for them to commit crimes. Yes, I mean, there were a lot of psychopaths prowling London at that time. There were a number of famous ones. Nothing's Canadian... changed. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a Canadian, Gordon Cummins, Neville Heath is one of the famous ones. Just a little bit later, actually. Anyway, um, but um, yeah, the blackout was imposed in order to make it difficult for, for German bombers to hit London. So the, the idea was to produce as little artificial light as possible so that street lights were off and black so-called blackout curtains. People had to put these things up, lined curtains to stop light seeping out of their houses and air raid wardens would go around monitoring adherence to the so-called blackout the blackout became was relaxed by the time the um the the so-called blackout bonnie and clyde were, were doing their stuff it, it had changed to the as from what i remember to the dim out which was a sort of, sort of modified version of the blackout it wasn't quite so stringent but you had things like you know cars would have to drive around at night with these very weak bulbs uh i think there was weak bulbs but they was certainly had shades over the headlights so the people could barely see and there were a lot of accidents and you ended up with, so the cur the curb side would be painted in sort of fluorescent paint and the yellow paint you do anyway to try and give people a bit of warning pedestrians of where the hell they were going and uh I think for a lot of people it was a kind of marvelous time because you know going back to the sort of sexual license you know, the, there was a kind of illicit sex scene of all sorts going on you know there were couples in doorways on Shaftesbury Avenue right in the middle of London and uh, they just wouldn't be noticed you know prostitutes would sh lurk in those doorways and would shine torches up at their faces and passers-by would just see a glimpse of a face in the doorway it was slightly alarming i would have thought yeah depending on what the face looks like there might be yeah losing. yeah i didn't think any of us look at our best sort of lip from beneath <laughs> well actually that's interesting because our our female uh, uh partner uh, in this is was actually on the game herself wasn't she Yes, in a kind of rather half-hearted way, I think. It was, uh, yeah. She had all these showbiz dreams. She, she'd run away from home. and, uh, and Boring old whales behind, right? Yeah, she'd been come from the sort of coal mining, poor part of the, the Welsh valleys, and she'd, she'd been to a reform school where she, she'd uh, been such a handful for her pet, poor parents. And uh, she'd run away to London with dreams of making it in showbiz and instead of which she'd ended up in a kind of seedy room in West London. And she meets in the milk bar you, you mentioned earlier, she meets this American army deserter. He claims to be a paratrooper, but actually he's just involved in the supply section of a parachute regiment, and uh, who are based on the edge of London. And he, he deserts and steals a truck, and he's already started to get involved in this kind of shady London scene of characters in cafes known at the time as white boys and um, <laughs> these sort of criminals often with wide suits very padded shouldered suits so it's kind of white boy in a literal sense and they um yeah they, they knew him by a different name his name was Carl Holton and he he had a wife and child, and he he previously led a perfectly law-abiding life, but like his soon-to-be Welsh accomplice, he had this fantasy life of himself, in his case, as a gangster, and he started telling people these tall stories about being a part of the Chicago mob, and he introduces himself by a totally different name, and as I think Orwell comments in The Decline of the English Murder, it's uncertain if if 
ever until after their well after the trial rather that either of the couple knew their real names yeah. or knew one another's real names put it that probably way probably not mm. and yeah. um she sort of it, yeah it's a sort of da- it just shows you how dangerous fantasy can be because well, sure. I mean, they egg each other on small town girl from a uh, small village girl really uh, mm. from, from wales and here's this with her with her hollywood fantasies and here's this handsome mm. american soldier and claiming to be you know far mm. above his rank and um she must have really felt like she was right in the middle of a, of a film yes yes i'm sure she did and and uh, he was trying to live up to her image of of him having told her about being a chicago gangster and uh, <laughs> it has Completely appalling, tragic results, uh, and and it, it, one of the things that interested me in it, in the story, I'd know, known about the story for a long time. Um, one of the things, as I say, that interested me was was the way it's had sort of echoes through the years afterwards. You know, contrary to what Orwell said, it wasn't forgotten. That it that pretty soon afterwards, it inspired a very very good novel by a now rather forgotten author called Arthur Laburne. Uh, though he's, I mean, he has connections to quite well-known things because he, he, his novel was the basis for Hitchcock's Frenzy, a late 1960s Hitchcock um, thriller, not one of the best, but uh, that's based on a Laburne novel called Goodbye Piccadilly Farewell Leicester Square, which is a song, um, lyric isn't it and um anyway yeah arthur laburne coincidentally just before writing my piece about the blackout bonnie and clyde i'd i have a novelist friend who's a very successful novelist who's has a sideline in reissuing um london but mainly london-based kind of working class mid-20th century novels and he's We've often swapped kind of notes, and I've encouraged him to reissue things. I encouraged him a few years back to reissue another Arthur Laburn novel called It Always Rains on Sunday, which spawned a brilliant Ealing Studios British film noir. Uh, it's wonderful, I and mean, it really is worth tracking down if you haven't seen it. Set in I haven't. Small, I'm gonna, I like the set, sound of it. <laughs> it's a very, it's a brilliant novel as well. It's it's set over a single day in the East End with a crime threading, these various lives interwoven around a criminal theme. And yeah, it formed the basis for a brilliant movie by the director of Kind Hearts and Coronets, the sort of black comedy, serial killing, Ealing comedy movie from the 1950s, um, or 40s, I forget the date. Anyway, 40s, I think. And yeah, anyway, but scrolling back, uh, I'd been asked just before writing the piece about the Blackout Bonnie and Clyde. I'd been asked by this friend who runs this London Books Company to do uh, an introduction to an, another Arthur Laburne novel, uh, a Brighton set one from the 50s called Brighton Bell. And I said to my friend, um, Would it be all right? Because I'm fascinated by Arthur Laburne's life. Could I write a uh, a short biography of him to to go with the book. And we got a bit carried away going back to word count, got totally carried away. What was supposed to be a biographical essay turned into something much more extensive. But it was a fascinating trawl through, through into this world. And as a result, I got a lot of, when I came to write the Blackout Bonnie and Clyde piece, I knew a lot about Arthur Laburn and about this novel based on the criminal couple. And Arthur Laburn had very quickly, after his first novel was published in 1945, and it was this book, It Always Rains on Sunday, which was immediately the film rights were bought, and it was a great success in, in Britain. And he he then followed it up with a book called his great title, very noir title called Night Darkens the Streets. And it's it's a fictionalized very obviously fictionalised version of the cleft chin murder involving Carl Holton and and um, what's her name? Georgina, Georgina. Well, whatever Elizabeth her name is. Yeah, real name. And yeah. um, 
And yeah, yeah, Arthur LeBurn created this novel, which was then filmed um, less successfully than it always rains on Sundays. And it was, it, 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 or Sunday rather, singular. Um, and yeah, it was fascinating to, to plot the development of this novel through the paperwork I managed to find. And, uh, and the novel, um, yeah, there are other echoes after that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was the sort of historical context that as much as anything it, it interested me in the case. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a real um, slice of time and place when you read the story. Um, now, obviously, we, uh, th it's funny how this this particular case has so many nicknames. You know, we've got the Blackout Bonnie and Clyde, mm. the Cleft Chin Murder. Now, OK, what is the Cleft Chin Murder? Because people are going to say, what's this Cleft Chin Murder? What's all yes, this it's about? Very hot, the whole thing? It's, it's about the, the victim. Um, if, well, there was a senseless murder carried out by... Cole Holton, really to impress his girlfriend, uh, where they pick up this taxi, catch this taxi in the blackout London, in blacked out London, and then Cole Holton shoots dead this poor taxi driver, and he he is the, the he's the owner of the cleft chin, the cleft chin being a dimpled chin, having a cleft in that chin, so he's got this rather sort of Kirk Douglas like chin. <laughs> Uh, that there are lots of photos on the newspaper in the newspaper coverage of this guy, and that's the shorthand. And there was there was another. None of them were very catchy names. You know, sometimes how these a lot of these crimes can become famous because, say, the police or the newspaper reporters coin some very snappy name for the case, <laughs> and that can a bit like launching. I suppose it's almost like launching a product, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah. That, sadly, in a horrible is. way. Yeah, yes. Um, that people create a kind of logo and a, a name for these things, and and this particular case, at one point, one newspaper tried to kept calling it the man with the the ink stained fingers, you know, which was yeah. hard to catch. There's no cachet uh, there. <laughs> no, and um, uh, yeah, and anyway, it's it's. It, it tends just to be referred to in history books as a sort of Holton Jones murder. Um, and it's become sort of emblematic of this lawlessness, which really reached a crescendo after the war um, that afflicted London. You know, it was an extraordinary amount of crime in the wake of the war. So by 1947, there were enormous numbers of guns circulating around around London and the crime, the, the number of teenagers, I, mean, I know this having written a, a, a kind of true crime procedural about a case in 1947, which was represented the, uh, the zenith or the nadir, depending on how you look at it, of, of, of this post-war crime wave. And it was, there was some dizzying percentage of under 20s and it was young people with criminal records in London at that time it was something like 18 percent um yeah extraordinary and uh and this particular the the crime I'd written about was uh again it was the sort of crime that Orwell would have disdained it was a gang of kids who ended up shooting dead this guy who tries to interrupt a robbery they, they robbed this pawnbrokers in the west end of London and they're running away. And in one of those, one of those moments that reality throws up that would just be totally implausible in fiction, they're running towards a crossroad in well, in, in mo true kind of movie style, their getaway car stalls, or it's wedged between two other cars. They park it there and someone parks in really close behind <laughs> them. And the getaway driver isn't a good driver. He can't get away, get out the space. And they end up running down the street, these three kids, the youngest of whom was 17. I think the oldest was about 21, 22. And they're running towards a crossroads. And this motorcyclist, who's just riding innocently down there, he realises they're up to no good and tries to block them. And one of the kids, just in the middle of the afternoon, brandishes a gun and shoots this guy in the head. And they run off. And 
the, the thing that's that so would be so implausible in fiction is that walking up that street, heading north up that street, is this middle-aged bloke. And he's he's on the other side of the pave, or other side of the street, walking along the pavement, and he sees a body slumped on the pavement with a motorbike <laughs> tipped over. And this is the victim of this is the victim of the shooting. Uh, and but he, he this man, Albert, thinks that um, it's simply the result of a traffic accident, and he realizes he hasn't got any first aid skills, so he thinks there's no point in him getting involved because there's already a crowd of people on, attending to this bloke lying on the pavement. And this guy, Albert, walks up and carries on with his plans. And he goes into this pub, the Fitzroy Tavern, further up the street. I used to where go he's there. Going to... <laughs> ah, right, how funny about it. And the Fitzroy Tavern was, a, was a, you know, it's a famous old pub. And it was once a famous, <laughs> at that period particularly, it was a famous sort of odd mixture of people would go there. You had people like the photographer Robert Cappell was going there while having an affair with Ingrid Bergman. <laughs> and there were politicians who'd go there. A lot of writers, people like Dylan Thomas, were going to the Fitzroy quite regularly, painters like Augustus John. And this guy Albert goes in there, and he, he's a friend of the landlord and landlady. And he's popping in for a drink, and he wants to say goodbye to them because he's going abroad the following morning, I think it is, or possibly that evening. And he's going abroad because his, his, he is Albert Pierpoint, the executioner, and he's off to hang some Nazi war criminals. And he ends up eventually executing two of the kids who he nearly witnessed carrying out this crime and killing this bloke who he thinks is a victim of a traffic accident. And that's one of those bizarre things that nonfiction has a habit of throwing up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is it, we've I've had this discussion with people as well in the uh, contributors about how if some of this stuff, if you made it into fiction, would probably you know a reader would say, yeah. "I'm sorry, I just can't swallow that." It's yeah, too ridiculous. and some of the, I love the stuff that's. I love the funny stuff. I mean, every now yes. and then, I mean, there's a true crime. I mean, there was a ele true crime element to it. I wrote a book about a London club owner, sort of nightclub owner and property magnate named Paul Raymond. He wouldn't mean a lot to American viewers. Uh, and the, the book, which was called Members Only, got filmed um, with Steve Coogan as Paul Raymond. It was filmed under the title The Look of Love. And anyway, but, but the main reason for mentioning this was that um, when I was researching the book, I used freedom of information to extract a file that hadn't been seen out of the Metropolitan Police, London Police, about Paul Raymond had been the subject of this quite long-running blackmail attempt. And he was receiving these phone calls, or the, uh, his club, which was this late 50s, it opened, called the Raymond Review Bar, and it was this kind of cabaret come strip club. The, but at that stage was very chic and you get visiting Hollywood stars and all sorts of people would go there. And a few years later, you had the Beatles filming part of the Magical Mystery Tour in there. And uh, um, anyway, yeah, Paul Raymond was the subject of all these threatening calls from the IRA. And it was they were saying, well, we're going to blow up your club if you don't pay us X thousand pounds. And the, anyway, the, these... Things were getting ever more menacing, and his wife had the brakes on her car sabotaged, and she ne she nearly crashed the car, and it was very sort of scary. And the police files documented, and they started tapping the phones. So I had all these phone transcripts of these blackmail calls from I, I can't remember the names of these people, but they were saying, you know, Mr. Raymond, it's the IRA here again, and it, it reaches this crescendo where. He, Raymond is by that stage owns a number of West End theatres and he's one of the theatres this is in the late 60s he his girlfriend he's left his wife and taken up with this glamorous girl who is starring in in, in a West End kind of sex comedy farce at his theatre called Pajama Tops uh anyway she, she the the, the 
partner, Fiona Richmond, who was a very famous figure of the day in London. And um, Paul Raymond gets the, he's, he's notified the police, and the police start monitoring these calls. And the, the IRA phone up the Whitehall Theatre, I think it was, that, that Paul Raymond owned and had his offices in. They say, Mr. Raymond, we, we, you know, we want the money now. We need it in a sort of suitcase. And the police are waiting to nab these IRA guys. And um, they, Raymond is told to go down to the foyer with this suitcase of money. And in true sort of film style, it's got money on the top and then it's sort of shredded, new, like bits of newspaper pretending to be pound notes or five pound notes in bundles filling up the suitcase and he goes into the foyer to meet the the ira messenger and the bloke comes in and he's not irish for a start which possible <laughs> who knows but that's possibly the first thing that that indicates that it might not be what it seems to be and then this guy says to paul Raymond, he says well while i'm here he's a sort of youngish bloke he says while i'm here could I have two tickets for myself and my wife for pyjama tops on Wednesday night? You think this is totally bizarre. And, and of course, it turns out it's nothing to do with the IRA. It's some sort of, well, criminal. I think he was a plasterer, a painter and decorator. That was it. He was a painter and decorator who had enlisted the help of this young guy who'd answered a wanted, a job ad who's desperate for a job and the painter and decorator employs him as supposedly as a painter and decorator but then forces the, his employee into being his sidekick in this idiotic blackmail plot of course they were arrested and i think jailed but they were certainly found guilty and again that was one of those things that's just so totally potty it was, yeah, it was well. so, <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, our, our couple in the story definitely, um, uh, it, they, they both seem to be really into their their uh, criminal activities. I mean, from what I gather, how you portray the story. I mean, I mean, we, I mean we, they're both really into it. I mean, it, it, you were saying too about how um, Carl, whatever Carl is his name, oh, wants yeah. to impress yeah. this girl. And, and you, yeah. you were just saying something and it triggered in my mind that scene where she wanted a fur coat and there's some woman walking up the mm. steps to a hotel with a fur coat and, oh, okay. And they, yes, they just, just pull up and, and Holt nips off and tries to snatch it off this woman coming out of a hotel. And then of course she struggles and he panics and charges off. And it's all, it's, it, it's just pathetic and sad and, Appalling. Well, it's just so, it's all very spontaneous too. Mm. I mean, it's, it, it, they didn't mm. really seem to plan. They just, just, I mean, opportunistic kind of crimes, would you say yes. pretty much? Not, not the brightest as well, I think. No, no. I mean, uh, I, I remember, remember you're saying they, they'll pass um, this girl riding a bicycle and they just go and grab her and take mm. her handbag and things like that. It's just, Mm, the random sort of desperate as well because he's so desperate to impress yet he doesn't really and i suppose she the, the, his partner in crime is so naive she doesn't really question the fact would a she would a real chicago gangster start snatching handbags off young girls on a bicycle yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so surely they do something a bit grander yeah, this is this is a very good point. I mean, the 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 the, um, the uh, people they targeted. It's just you know a nickel and dime or pence, whatever you want to say. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I mean, were they? Really what adds, were they the you phrase know, the taxi petty driver. crime. I mean, if you look at the phrase "petty crime," it's the petty. Yeah, very petty. Petty crime. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I mean, you were saying you you were saying that, that you know obviously crime was a lot of crime during this particular mm -hmm. period. But would you say um, this couple was sort of unique in in the type of crimes that they were committing, or was it more widespread than we might I think? think? It was pretty widespread, really. Um, and there are certainly a number of really notorious cases from that period of all kinds uh, of. Um, Yes, all sorts of psychopaths prowling London. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think of um, of examples, but I mean, there's a hell of a lot of crime in that period. I and mean, it was a, 
it was termed one quite famous guy from that period. He was very young, who later becomes a notorious 60s gangster on the fringes of all the sort of world of the craze and things. I remember meeting for some for other reasons a long time ago. Um, a guy called Frankie Fraser, known as Mad Frankie Fraser, um, <laughs> who terrified the craze. Um, oh God! <laughs> yes, That's I mean seriously. Something. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, they were just so fantastically brutal. This group. Anyway, he was. He referred to the, the to to this period with the phrase, "It was a villain's paradise." Mm. Because they're always built. They they pretend to be officials, sort of and sorting out bombed houses, and they were just robbing bombed houses. And they could really do what they wanted. And you 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 had in the West End of London, became, particularly so, the Soho area, very distinct from New York Soho. Um, the Soho area became a mecca for deserters, and. That seems kind of counterintuitive because it always puzzled me. I used to, I was interviewing all sorts of people about for a biography of a sort of Soho based writer, this guy Julian McLaren Ross, who was a, worked with Dylan Thomas and various people, he was a fantastic novelist. Um, and he, I mean, he imported a sort of just as an aside, a very kind of hard boiled American style into English fiction. He wasn't right necessarily writing crime stories at that point. He wrote, he wrote a wonderful novel that Penguin over here had brought us as a modern classic called Of Love and Hunger. It's a sort of, it's a story about the build up to war and a romance between, it's an autobiographical piece about being a door to door salesman and getting involved with this friend's wife, told in this very kind of clipped yet very curiously emotional style. Uh, and McLaren Ross was, yeah, when I was researching his world, of, he was particularly associated with in Soho in the 1940s, both the post-war and wartime forces. I was always puzzled when people were constantly talking about that part of London being filled with deserters. And you think, if you're a deserter, why, do you go, why would you go into central London or spend a lot of time hanging around in central London, especially when the police would periodically close off whole areas of the West End and would just use what the New York police would refer to as a dragnet later or possibly at that period too and um, actually what it was was it turned out that with wartime food rationing which was you, you use printed coupons these ration coupons to get your food and get clothes um, the the food, food wasn't rationed in the Soho was a sort of cosmopolitan area and I mean, which was very unusual in England at that time, despite attempts to kind of paint England as this, or Britain as this kind of cosmopolitan society retrospectively. It's just not true. But Soho was an exception to that. And um, there were a lot of French, Italians, Jewish, Russian, Poles, all sorts. And there were a lot of delicatessens. It was the only place, really, that you would find delicatessens or proper what they would refer to as continental delicatessens. And those sort of foods weren't rationed. So it was some way where you could actually... Because if you were a deserter, you wouldn't be allocated ration coupon. Yeah. So you would starve unless you got a source of food, unless you were stealing food somewhere. And, you, and people didn't have enough food unless they were on farms to just be able to share it easily so deserters would flock to Soho to have this food that wasn't rational like salami and things I mean it's sort of bizarre in a way that it just wasn't part of the system yeah. so you could, as long as you could get the money you could eat perfectly well and it was a sort of thieves and crooks school you know, you know right until fairly recent decades cafes around there would be you know, in places where you would get all sorts of shady meetings and things, and people, I mean, it's changed totally in the last sort of 20 years. But um, I mean, a friend uh, has an, had an uncle who was, his, he used to describe him as a failed gangster. <laughs> and his uncle used to meet, he, it, you know, it was his father's brother. And my mate, who's a, bit, who's a bit older than me, or quite a bit older than me, said he used to meet him in the 60s, you remember, meeting in these Soho cafes or CAFs in the London kind of slang. Uh, 
Um, and he would meet his uncle there with his dad and the uncle would forever be, he'd be on the make trying to you know, make money here and there and with these kind of schemes. And um, my friend was delighted. I remember when I, I had a book launch party for the book about the, this club owner, London club owner, when I was able to introduce my friend to this this former sort of very minor kind of gangland figure who said, oh, yeah, I remember your uncle. <laughs> so I said, what are the odds on that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That's funny. Well, I mean, you certainly um, bring us into the time period. I, I, I think a, a lot of this, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of history is lost and, and we have our interpretations of what it was mm. like during the war from mm. cinema and whatnot. Mm. But this is certainly an eye opener about what it was like in London at this particular time frame mm. and, and how it spawned these types of criminals. Yes, I mean, it was an interesting city at that point. I mean, I have a New Yorker friend or a couple of New Yorker friends who who loved London and increasingly they'd come over every couple of years and increasingly they've said well I'd rather see the rest of Britain because London just feels like New York it's been homogenized and I mean the London that I remember kind of most vividly is is gone and uh, yeah it was obviously it was a fascinating city in the, I'm sure people would say this well as the same his friend says the same about New York but uh, People are just yeah. priced out. The criminals yeah. and everyone else. No. Everything's sort of becoming the same place. It's uh, yeah. yeah. This is true, sadly, but yeah. I guess that's that. Yeah, yeah. I found it fascinating. These sort of one aspect of of Britain's past is this sort of idea that in pubs and, and particularly pubs, you would get certain pubs where people would mix from very different social classes and professions and backgrounds. So you get somewhere like the Fitzroy Tavern where you could get someone like, I mean, Ava Gardner used it when she was living in London in the forties at one point, and you could get her rubbing shoulders with some politician, you know, quite prominent politicians would use it. And then these kind of small time crooks and all sorts of people. Um, and that's the sort of thing that's largely disappeared from that world of English pubs. They've become much more sort of curiously. People would, if you ask some kid now, they probably would claim that our society is much more egalitarian. But actually, it's there's less mixing, which is something I miss. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just sort of goes somewhere and it's the same kind of people and the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty sort of stra more stratified in lots of ways. And it's stratified in just ways that are just different. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's codified in a different way, but it's, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's been really interesting hearing about your your story and the and the and 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 bringing us into this time. Um, the story, ironically, is called Whirlwind Romance, <laughs> and um, it's in the Best New True Crime Stories Partners in Crime. And uh, Paul Willits, I've been chatting with, and I'm. It's great that you've you've come back and you've really. Um, oh, thank you for inviting me again. I'm glad I didn't disgrace myself last time. No, you didn't disgrace yourself no, last no, time. Joking. I don't have on my list of with a big line. line <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, spending time time with me. And um, definitely, you know, Paul's story, uh, it's a, it's uh, the longest in the book, so he's broken oh. the record. for the, But uh, it's fascinating. Um, and um, hear about the blackout Bonnie and Clyde and the cleft chin murder. It's all rolled into one. <laughs> And uh, is there anything you um, want to um, mention that you're doing or want to plug before we go? Um, I mean, I've, I'm the only only thing I could plug most the most recent book I've had out was a book called King Kong, which is actually an American book published by Crown. That's a true crime book about a, a jazz age confidence trickster and imposter that may be of interest to one or two people out here. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe more. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's still yeah. in print, chugging along. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I know this. You asked somebody, what, what what are you up to right now? And then like in five minutes from now, everything can change and there might be something new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always changing. 
Yeah. Oh, well, thanks again, Paul. Well, it's well, been good chatting with you. Okay, Thank thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.